instructor and our counselor in Jesus name. Amen. So it's great to have, um, it's great to have the path that, you know, it's to, to have been looking at the book of Daniel and to have gone through that and, and, and come to this point in time, Daniel chapter 12. Let me begin um, as we look at this really important chapter, just by telling you a story of a true event that happened to me. I think it was about 2002, New Year's Eve, 31st of December, 2002. I was living in Bristol at the time and uh, my sister used to live just about a mile away from where we were. And because it was New Year's Eve, we thought, you know, the whole family, we go over to my sister's, we spend the New Year's Eve with her and we come back just after midnight, which is what we did. So we left our house about eight o'clock, um, <laughs> locked it all up and everything else, went to went to my sister's house. And, you know, we had a great time there. We had some, you know, some food and some, you know, laughter and a bit of partying and that sort of thing all through New Year's Eve until just after midnight. And then we thought it's probably time to get back now. So went back to the house, um, put the key in the door, opened the door, and I looked and I knew immediately that something wasn't right. Something had happened. Uh, some, of the, some of the cupboard doors were open that shouldn't have been, drawers were open that shouldn't have been, and I realised that we'd been burgled. And, you know, I looked around and, yeah, you know, my laptop had gone, my favourite leather jacket had been, been taken, Gwen didn't really have much, you know, expen any, any expensive jewellery, but she got some things her grandmother had given her uh, and, you know, they'd all gone. And, and I went to, to the back of the house and to the window there. We had the huge, great, big metal sliding doors uh, with glass in the middle. And someone had, must have made a heck of a racket, but had levered the whole door off its hinges, buckled back the, the, the frame, uh, glass had broken, obviously uh, come in. Now, the reason you think, why are you telling me the story and what's it got to do with Daniel chapter 12? Well, let me tell you, if I had, if I had known at the time, the, what time it was that those guys were going to come in and sort of break in, let me tell you, I would not have been out partying. I would not have been at my sister's house. I wouldn't have been just having, you know, just relaxing and chilling. I would have been a welcoming committee and been ready for whatever time that breaking was going to happen, you know. <laughs> Well, I'm going to say fists ready and all the rest. No, no, I don't mean that. But do you know what? I, mean? I would have been ready to be able to, you know, scare them off and it wouldn't have happened. But actually, when I look at myself, I wasn't ready. I was out partying. I was out having a nice time. But actually wasn't, I take my eye off the ball and I wasn't ready. It just happened at a totally unexpected time. And if I'd have known what time they were coming, I would have been there and it wouldn't have happened. And the reason for telling that story is this. Daniel chapter 12 is all about the end times. And the one thing about the end times is that we have to be ready. Once, when Jesus returns, it will be too late for any of us to suddenly get ready, suddenly get organized, suddenly get sorted. We need to get sorted now and we need to be ready. So, you know, I wasn't ready on that New Year's Eve on, in 2002. But actually, make sure, we must all make sure that we are totally ready for the second coming of Jesus when he returns. And, you know, whenever that will be, at the end of the end times, we need to be ready for that moment and for that time. You know, the second coming of Jesus and the end times is written about a huge amount in both the Old and New Testament. 318 times in the New Testament alone, there are references to the, to the second coming of Jesus and to the end times. 318 times. That's a huge amount. 23 out of 27 books in the New Testament talk about the return of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus and the end times. That's a huge amount. So the doctrine about the second coming of Jesus is crystal clear in scripture. It's an absolute certainty. Let me tell you the one thing, there are lots of things we're not can't be certain about in life. One thing you and I can be absolutely, completely, 100% nailed on certain about is that Jesus will return. Just as he came the first time 2000 years ago, Jesus will return. That is a clear, crystal clear doctrine in scripture that that is going to happen and that will happen. And so it's, it's not just, uh, you know, a little bit of sort of, you know, odd teaching just bolted on. I think a lot of people haven't really thought through 
the second coming of Jesus or what happens during those times, but it's crystal clear from the word of God. It's a, a doctrine that we need to know. And you know, the early church were really ready for it all the time. One of the phrases that the early Christians had, if they just bumped into each other in, you know, the street or, you know, wherever it might be, they would say the word Maranatha. And the word Maranatha means the Lord is coming. They had this absolute awareness, readiness that Jesus could return any time. And they was the Greek each other, the Lord is coming, the Lord is coming. And what's great about that, they were ready. They weren't like me on that New Year's Eve, completely unready and unprepared. They were ready. And actually, that is a state that every Christian default should be living in. We're ready for the second coming of Jesus, whenever that might be. And whatever end time situations we might have to live through, we need to be steeled and ready for that as well, which we're going to see, you know, in just a moment from Daniel chapter 12. So that's, um, that's just uh, by way of introduction. And I've just got several points I'm going to make, and uh, they're going to come up on the screen as well. That might just be a little bit helpful. So they'll come up on the screen as well, just for a moment. So if you're taking notes, get your pens out, and, uh, um, and they, they should all come up at the end, I think, as well. So, But the first one is this, talking about John chapter 12, the end times. The end times is a time of distress. The end times is a time of distress. It says in Daniel chapter one, there will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. Wow, so this is in Daniel 2,500 years ago, talking about the time of distress in the end times in Daniel uh, chapter one. A time of tribulation, a time of distress. In other words, a time when it's not gonna be easy to stand up and be a Christian. A time when it will be hard to do that. Both Old and New Testament talk about a time of tribulation, of distress, of um, uh, difficulty that will come at the, during the end times. And, and the tribulation period, the time of distress will end with the return of Jesus. And the Antichrist and Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire forever. That's uh, Revelation 19. And if you think, well, Matthew, isn't this just, you know, perhaps the book of Daniel, it's a bit, you know, what does Jesus have to say? Jesus talked a huge amount about the end times and being ready for his second coming. And uh, so Matthew's gospel, particularly Matthew 24, and let me just quote Matthew 24 verse 21, where Jesus says, so this is of the lips of Jesus, for then there will be great distress, unequaled, from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. Jesus talked about that time of distress, of tribulation, where it wouldn't be easy to be uh, a Christian. The kingdom of God has come through the resur resurrection of Jesus, but actually at the same time, there's times of persecution, of distress, of tribulation, and it's not easy to keep walking with Jesus um, uh, at times during that time. And even the early church went through a significant time of distress and tribulation. Um, you know, just, you know, a decade after Jesus had raised from the dead, it was fine for a very, very short time. But certainly if you look at the history of um, the early Christian church, they went through incredible times, particularly around the time of AD 70, Emperor Nero, the amount of persecutions and um, and dispersing of Christians and arrest and torture and killings of Christians. It was an incredible time of distress that they went through. And there have been times of distress in many nations over the last 2000 years, but certainly the teaching of the word of God is that at the end of those times, that distress is gonna increase and get even more than, uh, than perhaps it has been. So, um, so we shouldn't be surprised at that, but we should be prepared for it. That's the teaching of the word of God. Um, end times will be a time of distress. We shouldn't take us off our guard. Oh, why is this, this all happening? Well, it's written about Old and New Testament and from the lips of Jesus. We need to be prepared for it and we need to be steeled for how we're going to deal when it might be much more awkward than certainly in the UK, even it is now to be a Christian. Uh, some nations, Pakistan would be one of them, where already it's, it's it's much, much more difficult than, than it is for us. So that's the first point. Second point is this. End times will be a time of deliverance. The end times will be a time of deliverance. Uh, again, staying in verse one, uh, this is what it says. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written 
in the book will be delivered. So end times is a time of deliverance. Everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. Jesus, we know, is the only one perfect, complete deliverer, the one who has delivered us, uh, delivers us from evil, delivers us from the power of Satan, delivers us from the power of sin. Jesus is our deliverer now because we can experience forgiveness. And the song we sang earlier, Chains Falling Off, the kingdom of God has been ushered in with the, uh, the first coming of Jesus. Um, and and, and as Christians, we can experience right now the deliverance that only Jesus can give us, deliverance from the chains that are bound around us, from sin, from um, unforgiveness, uh, from death as well. So those chains have been broken for those who love and know Jesus already. But there will be a final, ultimate um, time of deliverance when Jesus returns at that time of the second coming as well. And who's the deliverance for? Well, it's really clear. Deliverance is for those whose names are written in the book, in the book of life. Those are the ones whom Jesus will deliver. Um, so the end times is a real encouragement for you and I to get right with God. If we're casual with God, if we're playing around with God, if we're taking God half-heartedly, be very careful because the whole teaching is that we must be ready. None of us know what time the Lord will come, uh, but come he will, and uh, we need to be ready. And only Jesus is the one who can deliver us. There's no other God. There's no other man-made system. There's no medicine. There's no anything that can deliver us. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. Our hope for deliverance comes in a person and his name is Jesus and we know who he is and what he has done for us. And if our name is not written in the book of life, then we need to be very afraid and we need to be very careful because the ones that are delivered are those whose names are written in the book of life. Those whose names aren't written in the book of life will not have any sort of automatic deliverance as well. And therefore, you and I need to ask ourselves the question, how is my walk with God? Am I walking with Jesus? Am I committed to him full on? Am I half-hearted or, 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 or full on? And if we're playing with God and we're just doing our own thing, really, but bolting on God to our lives, then be very careful with how you're playing with God if any of us are, and make sure that our names are nailed on in that book of life. Let me tell you, Jesus wants everyone's name to be in that book because Jesus desires that all would be saved and all would come to a knowledge of him. But the choice is ours. And the only way that that deliverance will come is making sure that our names are written in the book of life. Okay, third point. Uh, third point is this one. End times is a time of eternal destiny. End times is a time of destiny. Verse 2 says this. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Let me read that one more time. This is an important one, guys. Been, if we haven't you know, been taking it seriously so far, let's let this point make it uh, start to impact upon us. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. The Bible talks about only two destinies, two eternal destinies. One of them is heaven and the other one is hell. Those are the only two eternal certainties and realities that the Bible ever talks about. There is no in between. It's one or the other. The second coming of Jesus will be, as it were, judgment day. It'll be the time when we will all stand before God to give an account of our lives. And at that point, it'll be far too late to try and change our mind. Uh, when Jesus comes, uh, um, second time it will be too late for any of us to change our minds we need to have decided that now which is why um, this teaching from daniel 12 is so important and 
eternal the, the two possibilities or two options are either eternal life with Jesus in heaven, in paradise forever, or complete eternal separation from Jesus forever, hell. Those are the only two eternal destinies. It's one or the other. And if names are in the book of life, we can be sure and confident that it's heaven. If we're unsure about our names, the book of life, and we're not, you know, then then the only other option is eternal separation from God. And let me just give an illustration on this point. Um, a bit of a story, but it's uh, there was an imperial orchestra um, in a, a big country, and we, we're going back, you know, <clears throat> you know, 150 or so years ago. This big imperial orchestra, and it was a really talented, every musician was really top notch. There was one particular guy, he was one of the wealthiest in his city, he was a person of influence, and he wanted to be in the orchestra, but you know, he was not musical, and he couldn't play a note on any instrument. And because he so wanted to be in this orchestra, what he decided to do was he went up to the conductor and said, look, I'm sure he gave him probably a bit of a brown envelope with a large wad of money in it. And he said, look, can you just somehow get me into this orchestra? And the conductor said, I can't, you, you, you can't play a note of any instrument. He said, look, I'll do anything just to, to be part of it. So he said, okay. So they came to a deal. And what this conductor did was he said, well, okay, I'm gonna give you a flute. You can sit towards the back, you know, not in the front row, but towards the back. And, you know, when it's your time to play, you just get the instrument like this, put your lips to the, the, the you know, and, and but you don't make any sound. You just, you just, you know, going through the motions as it were, but not actually make it playing a note. And um, so this guy was really happy with that. So for two years, that's what he did. Orchestra played, great orchestra. And there was him sitting, well, not playing, his musical instrument for two years. Trouble is that the conductors changed after a couple of years and a new conductor came. He wanted to do, a, um, do an audition of every musician just to make sure everyone was up to scratch. And so this guy started really bottling it. What's he gonna do? He can't play a note on this instrument and he's gonna be found out. So he tries to go sit, but he eventually he has to go forward and sees the conductor and said, look, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm just a fake and a phony. I can't play an, any word of an instrument, note of an instrument at all. That was the day this guy had to face the music. He couldn't play a note and he was found out to be a fake and not to be genuine. Now, reason for telling that story is um, because when Jesus comes again, we will all be found out for how we've dealt with Jesus, how we're living or not living with Jesus. And if we're not living with Jesus, you know, we're going to stand before him on that day and, you know, we won't be able to fake anything at that point in time. We will be found out or will be revealed. And so it's really, really important. This Daniel 12 really nails this, that we need to be right with God. We need to be ready um, to live through the end times and for the second coming um, of Jesus. And we need to um, get right with God now and not leave it um, late let's none of us be a christian that goes through the motions of being a christian we've got the we can say the right words we we can kid on a little bit but let's make sure that we're following jesus wholeheartedly 100 percent, as well as we reasonably can um that's what um we're called to do so your eternal destiny and my eternal destiny hangs hinges totally on what you and i decide about jesus it's why it is the most important decision that any person can ever make. We choose our eternal destiny by what we decide about Jesus. It's clear and straightforward. And Jesus longs for all of us to be with him in heaven, in paradise. Death is not the end, it's the beginning of an eternal relationship with God. But if we've chosen to turn our back on him, then the only other option is not an option that God wants for anyone, but we will have decided it ourselves, which will be eternal separation. God will not force anyone to go to heaven if they've you know, decided to turn their back upon him um, on, on this earth. So what we decide in this earthly life will affect our eternal destiny. That's how important it is. Okay, um, just keep going through the points. And uh, the next one is this, end times is a time for wisdom. End times is a time for wisdom. 
I'm to two verses here. Verse three, carry on, just going through the verses. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. That's verse Daniel 12, verse three. And actually also in verse 10, it says, many will be purified, made spotless and refined. That is the amazing work of Jesus on the cross and uh, uh, resurrection. But the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. The end times is a time for wisdom. And let me tell you, there are really two different types of wisdom. One of them is a godly wisdom, a Jesus-centered, God the Father-centered, Holy Spirit-centered wisdom, a wisdom that comes from God himself. And the other wisdom is worldly wisdom. That can seem so wise in the world's eyes. But if it's leaving God out, it's unwise. And sadly, sometimes worldly wisdom can actually you know, just be a cover for a, really a satanic wisdom and an ungodly wisdom. Uh, so there's really important that in the end times that Christians discern godly wisdom from worldly wisdom. And I have to say, it does concern me how many Christians I speak to that are taken in far more than should be, I think, by the wisdom of the world and not the wisdom of God and where the wisdom of the world trumps the wisdom of God. Be very careful if that is how any of us are operating. Let me tell you, the wisdom of God always trumps the wisdom of the world. Full stop. Um, So, and, you know, Jesus told a parable about um, wisdom in the end times. And again, we see it in the book of Matthew, Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13, where Jesus tells the the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins. Um, And what what is the main point from that Jesus teaching, carry on teaching about the end times and the parable of the wise and foolish virgins is, who are the foolish people? Well, those are the, the people who were not ready for the return of Jesus, for the bridegroom to come. Who were the wise people in that parable? Jesus says, they were those that were ready for the return of Jesus. They were ready when the bridegroom comes. So from the lips of Jesus himself, be very careful that we're operating on godly wisdom, not worldly wisdom. And and at these end times, that's a a really important thing for every Christian to discern the difference between those two sources of wisdom. Okay, this one, this is, I love this point, next point comes from um, verse three, and it's this. End times is a time for evangelism. End times is a time for evangelism. And verse three says this. And those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. Those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. Daniel verse three. Sharing Jesus is the most important thing that you and I can almost do in the end times. Apart from being ready ourselves, once we're ready, then there's an imperative upon us to share the good news of Jesus as much and wherever and however we possibly can. Again, Jesus put it like this. Um, so, So I'm focusing on the Daniel passage, but I'm backing it up often with words of Jesus. So you can see how much the Daniel passage is a Jesus-centered passage. Matthew 24, verse 14, Jesus says this. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So Matthew 24, verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, comma, and then the end will come. So in other words, from the lips of Jesus and from the words in Daniel, there's a real necessity for every Christian to be doing all that we can to share the good news of Jesus with others, pointing people to Jesus. And let me tell you, if you have unsaved family or friends, share Jesus with them. Uh, Don't put it off, don't delay it. I'll give you a very recent example of this. My uh, my sister-in-law, Margie, she died yesterday. Um, and, and I have to look at myself and think, how well did I do 
in terms of sharing my faith with, with Margie. Um, and, you know, she certainly had, she certainly did have something of a faith, uh, praise God, but, but she's died now and it's too late for her to change her mind on what she thinks about Jesus. But did I, Matthew Fitter, do all that I can to tell my sister-in-law about Jesus, to just share my own testimony about what Jesus has done for me and what Jesus can do for her? And we need to think that through all those we know, our friends, our family, it's it's never too late. It's, it's never too early, rather. It is often too late. It's never too early to share the good news with family and friends. And do you know what? If people, while we need to do it wisely and in the love of God, um, we need to do it. And so I've been thinking, you know, my, myself, you know, did I do enough? And if I didn't, then you know, I'm, I'm, I need to be aware of that. And I need to be um, doing all that I can to share the good news of Jesus with others. And, you know, evangelism is for all believers. Some people are evangelists and they have a gift of evangelism and an anointing for it. But Jesus didn't call some to be witness to him. Jesus called everyone who follows Jesus to be his witness. And so if we love Jesus as our Lord and Savior and King, then we have to be witnesses. And even if the only thing we can do is to share what Jesus has done for us, your testimony is powerful and will impact lots of other people. Even if you haven't got every answer to every technical question that someone might ask you, we're always to be those that are ready to share our faith, but doing it with gentleness and respect. Um, preaching doesn't just take place in a pulpit on a Sunday. Preaching is 24-7 with the whole of our lives in how we are and who we are. So at these times, um, you know, at these times, and let me tell you, I'm going to say, especially in this pandemic time, let me tell you, the coronavirus pandemic is never an excuse for any of us as Christians to start easing off, to like just taking our foot off the accelerator, coasting for a year because we can't do anything or whatever. And it, let me tell you, it's not. In fact, this pandemic time is a time for every Christian to be even more on fire, even more evangelistic, even more taking use of every opportunity that God can give us to share our faith. Because the time is short, we can't just think, oh, well, I'll just put my life, you know, witnessing on hold for a year. And then maybe one day when everyone says, okay, I'll then start talking about Jesus. Jesus never says it's okay to stop talking about him. The early church who went through their own times of distress and tribulation, they never stopped talking about Jesus. Even when they were kicked out of their house and had to leave uh, Jerusalem, they went, they told everybody about Jesus wherever they went. They didn't think, oh, well, Nero's, you know, been a bit harsh at the moment. We probably better not tell anyone about Jesus. They kept going for it. And there's no biblical precedent to stop sharing the good news of Jesus. And so I would say, look for even more opportunities at this time. Not, And if we're coasting, get out of coast mode, get out of um, neutral and start putting yourself up through the gears, third, fourth, overdrive uh, as, as a Christian and as a witness for Jesus. Well done, guys. You're doing really well. Stay with me. Important stuff, all of this. One final point. So just hold with me. This one final point um, from Daniel chapter 12, and it's this. Except I've just... <laughs> Pardon? Thank you. Thank you. The, the final point, number six. End times is a, a time unknown. End times is a time unknown. It says, but you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. That's verse four. And interesting, it's repeated again in verse, um, in verse nine, where it says, go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. End times is a time unknown. Only God knows when he's going to return. I think very clearly that Jesus does know. Some people say that Jesus doesn't know when the end times was. That's not the case. While Jesus was limited to being a physical, 
you know, to, to the human limita limitations when he was God uh, um, on earth for those 33 years. Um, he limited, laid aside his majesty and uh, some of the powers that he would normally have. And at that point in time, when Jesus says, only the Father knows, absolutely. But let me tell you, the resurrected Jesus knows when the end times are. It's not hidden from him. And in fact, I haven't put it up, but if you look in the verse, uh, we see the man in clothes in linen, which was Jesus, with what, what one hand and then both hands up in the air as a sign of authority saying exactly when the end times will come after times, times and half a time. Jesus knows when the um, the end times are when he will be returning. Uh, the resurrected Jesus does know that. And, and we see it there in the book of, book of Daniel. Um, so Jesus will return at a time when no one is expecting it. I wasn't expecting, you know, back on that New Year's Eve for, you know, house to be, you know, busted into. None of us know when Jesus will return. We need to live daily ready for that point in time and however difficult the end times get however hard it might become um, to be a christian for some it already is for us not really much yet but it's it's possibly ramping up a little bit but actually we need to be ready for that time when jesus will return and let's pray actually from these the whole of the book of daniel including chapter 12 that God will make us into a bolder Christian than we have ever been before. That God will make us into a more courageous Christian than we have ever been before. The time is short. Don't wait. Don't gamble with God. Oh, I'll just put it off a little while and then I'll get serious for the last decade of my life. Get serious with God right now. It's a continual thrust of the teaching of the, the word of God. And Billy Graham once said, many times when I go to bed at night, I think to myself, before I awake, Christ may come. That is the readiness the early church had. That is the readiness that every believer, every follower of Jesus should have, is that we're ready for his return and that we're ready for whatever times of difficulty and trouble might um, potentially come our way. So I've said enough. There's the points are just going to come up as a summary here now. So all those six points that I've just made are going to come up in one final summary. Um, end times are the time of distress. End times are the time of deliverance through Jesus. End times are the time of destiny. It's heaven or hell. End times are the time of, for wisdom, godly wisdom, not human wisdom. Discern the difference. End times are the time for evangelism, sharing the gospel as widely and as much as we possibly ever can and finally end times is a time unknown many people as bible scholars as they go through all these think they can work out pretty much exactly when we, they think god will come yeah uh, be, be you know jesus was very clear don't, don't listen to those people that are specul un unhelpful speculators about the end times what we have here from Daniel 12 shows us how we should live and how should we should be ready. But we should be more spending more time sharing the good news of the gospel in the end times than just trying to work out when we think in exact dates gonna be and all those sort of things. There are some things that God will show us in his time, not our time. And so we need to be looking and ready and, and prepared. So I've said a lot today, and I'm just gonna finish now with a prayer, then we're gonna hand back to Michael to listen to some worship. But before we do, I think there are two responses. And the first response I'd like to give is for anybody, and you are not sure about whether your name is written in the book of life or not. You're not sure whether you've really committed your life to Jesus or not. If you have, then be confident about that. That's great. But if you know you're not, if you've backslidden, if you've never yet given your life to Jesus as your Savior, Lord and King, I want to implore you, do it today. In fact, I'm going to say do it right now as I lead just in a prayer of commitment to God. And when we pray that prayer of commitment, if we're really genuine and we're really serious about, yes, Jesus, I want to follow you for the rest of my life. I'm willing to admit my sin. I believe, Jesus, you died on the cross for my sin. And I want to confess them all to you and ask you to come and clean me up. And I want to be a Christian. I want to follow you, Jesus, for the rest of my life. If you've counted the cost on that one, then what you need to do, you need to invite Jesus into your life right now and and then you can know for sure that actually yes your name is written in the book of life that you don't have to worry is it or isn't it because you know that you've you've
committed your way to following Jesus. So for anyone, you know that God's calling you into that relationship with him. You want to spend eternity with Jesus in heaven, not with Satan in hell. Then, And you've never prayed to invite Jesus into your life. Then now is an opportunity for you to do that. You can get right with God. God will straight away begin to come and clear up your life, clean up your life as you repent, as you confess, as you get right with Jesus. You thank him for shedding his blood for you on the cross, that you might be forgiven, that you might be accepted, that you might be received in to a relationship with Jesus. So let's just close our eyes. And for anyone who's making that commitment now for the first time, or as a recommitment, because you know you've fallen away from God, then just pray this prayer quietly in your heart after me. Dear Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I've done so many things that are wrong and wicked. I admit that I've gone through life my own way and not your way, Jesus. I'm sorry for every sin that I've said, that I've done, that I've thought, that has displeased you. I confess it to you, Lord God, and I'm genuinely sorry. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe that when you shed your blood, you shed your blood that I might receive forgiveness, that I might receive freedom, that I might receive deliverance from all the chains that are around my life. And I thank you for dying on the cross in my place. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Lord, I say to you today that I'm willing to follow you, not just for today, but for the rest of my life. I commit my life from this day on to be a follower of Jesus, to be someone who seeks to keep close to Jesus, to please Jesus, to go your way in life, Lord God, not my own way. And I seek to follow you as well as I can for the rest of my life. And I ask you now to come in, Jesus, as my Lord, as my saviour, as my deliverer, as my king, and as my God. And I ask that you would fill me now to overflowing with your wonderful Holy Spirit. And Father, may I experience the power and the presence and the love and the goodness of God beginning to work in me right now. And would you complete that work in my life? In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So if you prayed that prayer and you really meant it, then you become a Christian. Your name is written in the book of life. And now you need to keep praying to God, reading the word of God, following Jesus, getting stuck into church and, and growing in your walk with Jesus from right now, from this day on. And God bless you. You made the most wonderful decision you could possibly ever make. And I'd like to encourage you to just make contact with us if you can, if you would. Um, by going to our website, annalyteamministry.org.uk, you'll find on there a section that says Knowing Jesus. If you click on that link, Knowing Jesus, then you'll find you can just write me a little email and just say, you know, I made a commitment to Jesus this day. Um, you know, maybe give me your details and I'd love to be praying for you, uh, send you some, um, you know, Bible and just make sure that do all that we can to get you um, hooked up to, to following Jesus well. Um, at, a, at a good church so do do that if you possibly can and then just before we hand over to Michael just a final prayer for others who might be responding to God in a different way and Jesus I just want to pray Lord God as we've gone through the book of Daniel and we come to the end of Daniel chapter 12 and we've heard all about the end times and the second coming of Jesus Lord it's a passage that that challenges us to get right with you, to get fired up with you, to be on fire and alive in you, Lord God. And so, Father, for some of us, Lord, we're confessing that we've been watered down Christians, that we've been a bit of a fake or a phony imitation of what we should be. Lord, we confess that and we say from today, Lord God, we're signing up to follow you well, to share the good news more effectively than we've ever done. Lord, to be on fire for you, to be alive with you, Lord God, and ready for your return and helping appoint others to, to you as well. 
And so, Father, I just pray, come by the power of your Holy Spirit right now and fill us to overflowing with your Spirit. Give us a spirit of courage and confidence that we might be good end time followers of Jesus. Amen. Amen.